and welcome to The Big Questions. My name is Nilu Tabrizi, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's conversation. Today we're discussing the election of President Donald J. Trump with historian Bill Brands, political scientist Will Howell, and sociologist Jeff Manza. Our goal is to open a discussion about some of the big questions raised by President Trump's election, big questions that gain insight from the perspectives of history, political science, and sociology. Leading into election night, most national polls showed Clinton with a slight edge over Trump of about three percentage points. Nate Silver's 538 election forecast gave Clinton an over 70% chance of winning. Yet despite these polls and prediction, Trump won the election with 304 electoral votes compared to Clinton's 227 electoral votes. Why did the pundits and pollsters get it wrong? Well, can you get us started on this one? Sure, a couple things ought to be said up front. One is that, uh, sometimes the 30% is what actually happens, right? So saying that there's a 70% 70 pro probability that something is going to happen is not, you're not shown to be wrong when the 30% thing pops up. The other thing which is worth noting is that in fact, Clinton won nationally by about three percentage points. So the polls, when you look at the nation as a whole, looking at the popular vote, got it about right. Now the polls state by state were wildly off. Um, they were, and there was a, a market a democratic bias uh, at state level polls, and those tended to be with smaller samples. Um, and polling is really difficult it, with the rise of cell phones, getting representative samples, not just of citizens, but of likely voters is just in terms of measurement is a very difficult thing to do. Um, and so they were, they were off. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things worth noting here um, that I think that the broad perception among media commentators, pundits, pollsters, was that Trump was going to lose the election and that it was a big shock for a lot of people who I think anticipated that if anything, Trump supporters would be less likely to turn out, that, that, uh, you know, that, that Hillary had a number of organizational advantages that, that would, would help her get her people to the, to the, uh, to the uh, polls. And, 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 and uh, you know, I think that, that didn't really happen, particularly in those kind of critical Midwestern states where, where the election was decided. Uh, and where the polls were most off. I'm not a pollster. I'm a historian and sometimes pundit. And I got everything wrong about Donald Trump because I kept thinking that there would come a time when this protest candidate would hit a glass ceiling. And it, this happened to Ross Perot in 1992 when it was really clear that Perot was the candidate for people who didn't like the candidates out there. But if you watched his polls, they would go up until they got to the high teens. But once they got near about 20, then people started to think, you know, this guy might actually be president, and I can't imagine that. And I thought that would happen to Trump almost in the early days of the primaries. I thought after he got the nomination, it would certainly happen during the general election. So there's a strong tendency for people, well, with a historical bent like me, to think that if something hasn't happened yet, it's not going to happen this time either. I'm not going to liken the election of Donald Trump to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. But one of the reasons that those occurred, despite intelligence mounting that something was going to happen, was nothing like that had ever happened. And nothing like Donald Trump had ever happened. So it was really hard to imagine ahead of the time that it would happen. And we had lots of reasons to suggest that it wouldn't. This is going back to your point, that big money advantages to um, uh, Hillary Clinton, lots of organizational um, advantages, and she had all the experience. And his negatives were 65 percent. There was a sense, and right, th this 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 former game show host, um, reality TV star, certainly couldn't make headway. And we kept waiting. Pundits, you, me, you too, I'm sure. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. Right, kept waiting for. Well, th th we've, this is played out, but this is as far as it's going to go, and. And that continues. I think right now all the talk is about when is he going to be impeached, right? How, how quickly he's going to fall off now, and yet he's like so the So what's the role Ener of the polarized media in this? Because the media, the media atmosphere, the media context is different than it was 30 years ago. And so now it's entirely possible for people to live in their own media world and hear things that simply reinforce what they already believe. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important issue that, that uh, you know, plays into some of the interpretation of these polls. I mean, it was always a very close election. There was a brief moment where Clinton, after the, the Billy Bush uh, tape was released, where Clinton jumped to a seven or eight per percent lead. But for the most part, the margin was relatively small. And yet, 
um, a lot of the commentary was that, uh, you know, was that Hillary was, was much, much further out in front than she really was, particularly when we think about turnout as, as shaping the, you know, the final outcome. Um, so I, I think in general, you know, what we, what we see is a declining objective media, a, a media that, that tries to kind of, of, of offer objective analysis that is independent of the, of the two sides in this, in this election in favor of let's hear what they have to say and what, what they have to say. He said, she said. Um, and then there's, of course, the partisan media, from Fox News to on the right to, to MSNBC to some degree on the left, and, and of course all the, the websites and blogs that, that have a clear partisan focus. So, you know, you could as a citizen live entirely in this election in your own media space that doesn't really you know, reflect a, kind of a broader set of question, you know, issues on the table. So let me just share this with you. I was at Donald Trump's victory party on election night. I was in the Fox News press pen. Um, all the press was kind of cordoned off away from what was happening. And you felt a shift. I think around 9.30, the crowd, all his attendees put on the red hats. There was more drinking. There was more interaction with the press. And I started to think about, have we ever been this caught off guard? Are there other elections that have happened that you know, maybe we didn't expect this kind of outcome. Where does this one fall? Well, the 2000 election, uh, Florida was called for Al Gore before it was uncalled, and then it was in dispute for weeks afterwards. So I mean, that was one that was perhaps even more on the knife edge than this one. Yeah, in 1980, uh, there was a very late shift to Ronald Reagan that, that made the election not close at all. But two or three days before election day, the polls were showing a very, very close race with Jimmy Carter. But I think this was unusual in not so much in the popular vote, but in the regional differences in, in polling results and, and uh, election uh, uh, outcomes. This is worth underscoring, that we don't so much have one national race as we have 50 state races, each with a certain number of electoral votes in play. And so he, this is why we have a president who lost the popular vote by oh, two and a half percentage points, um, but he won bare majorities in a number of key states that put him over the top. And so uh, the, the polls were certainly off in those states, but there also is a big margin of error because uh, within those states. Jeff, can I ask you a question? Uh, what's the role of residential sort of self-partisan segregation here, where neighborhoods seem to be all Republican or all Democrat? It seemed to me in this race, there were fewer people who even knew a supporter of the other side. I live in Austin, a liberal city. I did not see a single Donald Trump sign or bumper sticker or anything. I prob I, if I really tried hard, I could have identified some people who might vote for Donald Trump, but they certainly weren't making themselves visible. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's happening in, in recent years with the rise of data analytics and more careful targeting is that the campaigns tend to center on a, a very small number of states is critical. And the candidates are not even really contesting Texas or California or New York where the outcome was assumed all along. So one reason you may not see as many signs was that the Democrats essentially had conceded Texas to to Trump and uh, we're, we're really fighting hard in just a few places where they're concentrating their resources. On the more general question of, of um, you know, partisan divide by region, by neighborhood, I mean, this is certainly something that has been going on for some period of time and it is kind of contributing, I think, to some degree to the polarized environment in which we're living, in which, uh, you know, people talk less to people with different views than they might have 30 or 40 years ago. And we have some pretty good data on this. Um, you know, the kinds of conversations people report having are different than they were, and they're less diverse than, uh, uh, than they were years And if years you can ago. get people to have those conversations, do they moderate or change their views? They can. And, you know, if you are exposed to a wider range of views, the likelihood that you can, can, can cognitively change a position goes up. And, and that has diminished over time, and I think that becomes part of the kind of reinforcement of of political views. And it's not just about whether or not two people from different perspectives speak to one another or that they update their views on any particular policy issue. It's also the extent to which you think that your views are representative of the country as a whole. And so one of the things that happens in a highly fragmented media uh, environment that we have and people are siloed is that then they're surprised when, when things don't break the way that they would like them to break because all they hear are voices that reinforce their priors. So it isn't just, again, about what do I think, what are my policy convictions, it's the extent to which my views are represented, what country do I live in, right? And there's, 
I think a lot of people were genuinely surprised that how could one possibly support a criminal in, in uh, Hillary Clinton or a racist in Donald Trump, right? That, that because we live increasingly in these environments that are... What's the role of a candidate who denies the legitimacy of polls and maybe preemptively denies the legitimacy of the election itself? Can I stop you to turn to an audience question? Would that be okay? <clears throat> now let's see if we have a follow-up question from our audiences. Do you want to go ahead? Going back to the, how the pundits and pollsters got it wrong, let's just go from the assumption that they, they did get it wrong, although I, I, your point is well taken. Uh, for those of us who do social science research, there seems to be a, a backlash now against facts in general and data in general, so this idea of alternative facts. Do you think that this whole sort of uh, pointing to look, social, science, social scientists don't know how to get this right, and so does that then call into question all of the data that we have collected and continue to collect? Social scientists, please weigh in. <laughs> I think there are layers to your question. One has to do with how do we establish the role of facts in policy deliberations um, that are going on and decisions that we're going to have to make as a country about what we do, about big, challenging issues. There are also, though, I think there's a, a reckoning that the press faces right now, which is how much attention do they want to pay to horse race kind of coverage? How much do they want to report on the results of the latest poll? And, and, and to my mind, that kind of updating is, I'm glad that that reckoning is happening. Um, that I'm deeply troubled as a social scientist about the ways in which fact-based discussion is, is being denigrated and denied. Um, um, but I would like to see a media pay more attention to issues that we as a country face. Um, and, and less to the horse race coverage. Well, what do you do when the, the media again and again point out that Donald Trump did not release his tax returns? And after you've said it in, in the media, if you say it 100 times, yeah, it's no longer news if you say it the 101st time. And if you get stonewalled by the candidate, then you're wasting your breath and you have to go on to something else. To what extent do the can, can a candidate dictate the terms of the coverage? of his campaign? It's a really great question, and I think one of the most striking things about this campaign was Donald Trump's refusal to acknowledge certain facts or issues and just refuse to, to uh, accept certain things as factually accurate and get away with it. And in other words, to win the White House. Um, and whether this is a, a harbinger of, of a new era where you can contest what seem to be basic, well-established facts about American society, uh, and, and, and not be called on it. I think that's kind of one of the, the critical things that, that Trump is going to uh, uh, potentially make possible for future politicians and, and uh, candidates for office. We're talking about polls right now. He loved to talk about polls when they showed that he was up in the, in the particularly during the primary race. That's, he talked about that more than anything. And, and that when the polls become less favorable, as they are right now, they're all fake polls and by, uh, by yeah. fake, fake media. I mean, Trump goes on the offensive at the, at the slightest drop of a hat. And if the polls turn against him, the polls are wrong. And the media is wrong. And, and now he's, he's in a moment as we're doing this taping where he's a little on the defensive over a set of issues. And so he spent 70 minutes yesterday attacking the media in a, at a press conference uh, as if the media is the enemy here. That, um, that you know, in a sense, this is a, a very different style of leadership than we've, I think, Bill, I, you'd agree, than we've ever seen. So yeah. let's, let's maybe take an audience question, see if anyone, we have a Facebook Live question. We have a two-part question uh, from Facebook. Um, Maggie and Jeff are asking, do you think people were afraid to tell po pollsters that they were voting for Trump? And the follow-up question from Patrice is, are polls less accurate when a candidate is associated, associated with racism, which we worked so hard to deny despite evidence of its prevalence? There was a lot of discussion about the possibility that people might be reluctant to tell pollsters that they were supporting Trump. And there is some evidence in previous elections. The Ross Perot uh, candidacy in 1992 is probably the, um, the, the best example of this, where a number of people were reluctant to say they were supporting the third, the independent third party uh, candidate, Ross Perot. Um, but I, th I don't think we really saw that. I think actually, um, what we saw were some parts of the country where um, uh, the polls got it wrong 
And in those places, what we, what we know less is whether this was a turnout issue, so people told pollsters they were going to vote for Clinton and then didn't bother to show up, or whether there was some under uh, statement of Trump support in those states, in those regions. You see that in the exit polls, that this is where right after people cast votes, uh, they'll, you know, somebody from a major media outlet will call you over and say, who did you vote for? They, they reliably show um, a Democratic bias. The question is how big that Democrat bias is. And most The bias is in the choice in the of the person of, to ask or the answer given? In the, in the answer given. That is, okay. I mean, we, they, exit polls overstate the vote share that Democratic candidates are going to get. Okay. And the story that most people think is that has less to do with people lying when they give answers and more to do with the people who are willing to come over yeah. and answer a question yeah. when they're called over. If you're whiter and richer and male, you're going to keep go walking when somebody tries to call, pull you over. Yeah. And those people are disproportionately rep uh, Republican. Interesting. Yeah. So to wrap up this question, I'd like to get a brief takeaway from each of our authors. So Jeff, why don't you start us off? I guess I, I as, a, as a sometime survey researcher, I, I guess I want to defend my industry. I think actually in many ways, you know, we got it more or less right. She did win by close to what people predicted in the, in the national uh, vote. And, you know, in some ways picking on the pollsters may be the wrong thing. Maybe we should really be looking at the media, media coverage and in discussion of, of polling results as the, the real culprit in this election. I, I, I generally agree with that, that um, the reckoning is one that, that the media faces. They need to start thinking about the role of horse race coverage, the kind of credence they want to give, the amount of resources they want to devote to that as opposed to other issues. Um, the polls got it basically right on the national vote, but they were wildly wrong at the state level and the pundits across the board got this one, got this one run, which raises foundational issues about the role of punditry in democratic discourse. In most elections till now, the media has set the broad outlines of the, the terms of the debate, the things you can't do, the things you can do. Donald Trump demonstrated you don't have to listen to the media. If you're a particular type of candidate, you can set the terms, you can change the rules. Well, that wraps up our discussion on why the pundits and pollsters got it wrong. Thank you for taking the time to watch The Big Questions.